Hello, hello. Welcome to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Today, we are talking about balancing mental health part two. So last week, we talked to um, Reginald A. Howard, and he gave us some great words of wisdom for Black mental health, um, particularly with Black men. However, you know, I couldn't have this discussion and not bring on the female perspective, okay? okay. Um, because both are important within our community. So I have the honor of bringing on Dr. Amani Johnson, who just happens to be my first best friend, like the first best friend, like go back crib mates, okay? <laughs> crib mates. Um, but to the rest of the world, she is a psychologist, a student of color specialist at the University of Buffalo Counseling Services. Welcome to the show, Mani. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So glad yes. to be here. Of course. So I definitely wanted to bring you on a couple reasons. One, um, you and I have had plenty of conversations about mental health. Um, I was a psychology major in undergrad. You saw it all the way through to the PhD. <laughs> so kudos. Um, but as a psychologist and as a Black woman in America, I think you have a very unique perspective when it comes to talking about balancing mental health, right. especially right. when... Um, from my perspective, I feel like Black women are um, who needs mental health the most because we we pretty much carry society. But we've also conditioned ourselves to recognize that like we have to carry society and that we have to be there for everyone. Yeah. And we develop this like Black superwoman complex. Yes, yes. So one of the goals for today is to kind of just debunk that a little bit and talk about real like steps to how we can fix this. Right, right. For sure. Um, but I would like to start off by asking you personally, like what is the dream for you? Oof, what is the dream? Um, I think when I think about the dream, right? It, mm -hmm. For me, it's, it's about daring to dream bigger and never, never not pushing myself to dream bigger. I okay. think um, as a black woman and just like, you know, thinking about where we've come from historically and where we are now, sometimes we can find ourselves in positions where we, what we see around us is, is what we think is possible. Right. And I think I'm right now challenging myself to think beyond that, like seek other experiences, seek other opportunities, and really just ask myself on a regular basis, like, why not me? Right. Mm -hmm. Like if this person can do it, if this person can be successful, um, why am I putting limitations on myself? Um, mm. So I think that's part of the dream. But I think another part for me personally is just like bringing healing to our community mm -hmm. because I think um, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the Black women and, and all that we carry. Like we are at the intersection of having to navigate racism mm -hmm. and having to navigate systems of oppression because of we are women. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and please don't add LGBT anything. I was just about to say, like, don't add LGBT, don't add ability status, don't add <laughs> SES, like any other intersection. We're it's talking about it's a lot. exactly. So yeah, the dream, the dream is healing. The dream is healing for our community, and the dream is um, like pushing ourselves to to dream bigger always. So. Yes. So I wanted to tap in a little bit when you're talking about like dreaming bigger. Um, I think that's why it's one representation matters. Yes. Right. And not only seeing what's possible, but seeing someone who looks like you do it. So when I think about the people who I consider mentors, um, some of them don't even know who I exist. Like Candy mm -hmm. Burns from Escape, that is my mentor. One day yes. she doesn't know it. Yes. But I'm learning from her. <laughs> Um, so a, a lot of people I look up to, like Candy Burris, um, Beyonce, Oprah, mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Nichols, who's a phenomenal motivational speaker, Ayala Van Zant. And when I think of all five of those women, they're all Black women who started mm -hmm. first generation wealth. Yes. yes. So what that does for me is it takes away the, it can't be, it's not possible. They weren't given their wealth. They weren't, they didn't inherit their wealth. They created it for generations to come. 
um, just by tapping into what their their organic skill set is. Um, mm-hmm. So not only having people to look up to, and then also I have, of course, I have mentors that I can actually call. <laughs> right. That's um, so great. <laughs> But um, but also, I think it's important to be connected to to people who are doing good things. Yes. So being connected to people like you, who you have child, your whole PhD, okay? Come on, okay. <laughs> but being surrounded by people who don't let you off the hook. Yes, and even if they, right, even if it's in different circles and different arenas and different dreams. I'm constantly surrounding myself with people who are dreaming bigger. And because they're dreaming bigger, I got to dream bigger in my own respect. Exactly. Exactly. Because we looking at each other, we holding each other accountable. And we're also like, we're supporting each other. Like Mm -hmm. when I see you win, that's a win for us. All of us. That mentality. And so I think it's spot on. Like having people where you can look at their experiences and relate so personally to what they've been through, it, it can, it's only evidence that like, oh, if I ever thought that I couldn't, that this is disproven right mm-hmm. here in front of me. So Absolutely. Yes. So when did you realize the dream and how has it changed over the years? Ooh, girl, I'm, I'm still realizing the dream. <laughs> <laughs> it changes every night I go to sleep. <laughs> every single night. Like I think, of course, there, there have been moments where um, the light bulbs go off. So I, I can I can recall like um, being an undergrad um, and feeling like okay I know I want to I know I want to get an education and possibly PhD but I don't really know what that means. I just know I want to help my community. Okay. Um, and being in in an undergrad course on psychology um, and for the first time now it, this is one point it took me to my ju- junior year to really okay. figure out like what what I wanted to do with that. Go sooner than most, so that's fine. Exactly. Some exactly. people graduate and still don't know what they're gonna do. That's exactly, exactly, and that I think that's okay. I think that's the mm-hmm. message that you know is really important to put out there. But um, being in that course, and then for the first time, like having an instructor, a professor, talk about um, the black experience and within psychology, in that like, my mind. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, what? Like, I can mirror this work with my community and do research and and you know work with underserved poppy all of that um yeah. so that was definitely a light bulb moment. And that's the clinic yeah period <laughs> <laughs> i just you know throwing it out there private practice hello. consultation hello because i truly listen i honestly believe i don't think entrepreneurship is everybody for everybody mm-hmm. but i definitely believe entrepreneurship is biblical like mm-hmm. you think about back to the Bible days, it wasn't titled entrepreneurship, right? But people made a living based off their gifts. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's no reason why we can't. You know what I mean? Like, there's no re- again. Why not me? If not me, who? If not oh. now, when? When? <laughs> oh, exactly. okay. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. so how does mental health impact us as black women in America? Let's dig into that a little bit. That's, a, I mean, that's, that's the question. So many ways, I think, um, historically and, and currently, like black women aren't given the space to fully experience difficulties with mental health. Like if a black woman has anxiety or has depression um, often it's misconstrued as like, you know, you know, she is, uh, she has an attitude or she, um, she ain't no good as a woman or she's lazy. Like all of these, all of these characteristics that we place on black women who are struggling with their mental health. Um, and I think an additional piece of this that I, I like being in the field I want to name is that historically the field of mental health and psychology has not been good to, Black women in communities of color. Like, I think as psychologists, we have to name that and we have to acknowledge that and do the work to to fix that because, you know, there are plenty of examples of, and even today, when you look like, look at who's getting funding, who's -hmm. who's getting um, research interests, who our treatments are characterized Mm -hmm. around, um, cis, hetero, white men. And so that leaves out the stories and the experiences of a Any lot of folks. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Yeah. So I think it's I think it's both ways. And then also like I think within the black community we're in a, we're evolving. Like historically there's been a lot of stigma. Um and there's it's still there around mental health. But I but think I feel like we're digging at it. We're we're chipping away at the stigma. We are. We're trying. You know, we have we have our own hurts and I think our cultural background, like we see things in a in a particular way. Um, but we are trying and we are creating spaces or example like having this discussion right now right you know so and I think for I've heard a lot of people in the past like a year or two say like I think I'm gonna try therapy Mm -hmm. and that one it makes my heart so proud because therapy is not just for crazy people like therapy is for sane people like I go to therapy even when everything is okay, just because I'm carrying so much responsibility yeah. um, as a motivational speaker, as a development coach, as a cheerleading coach, as someone who's constantly pouring into the lives of others. Yeah. I need somebody to pour into me. Yes. You and know, it. and it's worth it. it. But what I will say, um, especially if you're considering getting a therapist and, you know, you can put your two cents up, of course. Um, but I always recommend people get someone that looks like them, gender and race. Because I feel like there's nothing a black man can tell me about being a black woman. And there's nothing a white woman can tell me about being black in America. Mm-hmm. But when I start with someone who is black, is female, somewhere close in my age range, like it takes away a lot of the explaining like you get it i don't have to explain to you what my life is like because you already get it right 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 i think that's super valid like i i I recognize and even in my own personal experience i recognize the importance of walking into a therapy room or any room right and seeing people who look like you who you feel can understand your experiences so you know in a perfect world i think that if people had access to that and all spaces, that would be great. However, like I'm in the field and I recognize like even locally here and, you know, shout out to Buffalo. Um, it's a, it's very rare that you see women of color, men of color in the mental health field who are practicing clinical work. And so I think maybe I have maybe one or two folks um, who are in the community, maybe even less than that, who are in the community here doing that work. And so what I really, again, this this leads to a conversation about within the field. What I'm trying to do is work with other clinicians, white clinicians and other clinicians of color to raise their competence, their ability, their knowledge, their skill set to working with communities of color. Now, of course, there's going to be things and lived experiences that you will not understand. Just the same as, like, I will not understand fully the experience of working with a trans person. However, we have to be thoughtful about the intersection of identities. We have to be thoughtful about culture. And so when I'm working with white clinicians, I'm I'm explaining to them and then having conversations about how do you do that, you know, Mm -hmm. because I think we can't just say, well, there's no black woman in my age range around me who's doing therapy, so now I'm just not going to go to therapy. Like... Mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to learn how to advocate for ourselves, to seek out the supports that we need. And we have a right to advocate ourselves, even if we're working across from a person who doesn't look like us. Okay. That's fair. For sure. Um, And even with the conversation of access, um, one thing that I didn't realize when we talk about the historic separation um, in my mom had actually brought this to my perspective. She's like, if you, like now therapy is, or mental health uh, treatment is considered preventative, you know, preventative medicine, um, but go back 20, 30 years, it was not. And yes. so she was saying like, if you weren't rich and couldn't afford yes. therapy out of pocket, mm-hmm. you didn't get it. And so the people who could afford it were white women. So that's how therapy became a white female thing. And the stick was created because there were people who worked for insurance companies and their sole job was to validate that you were crazy enough to need mental health. Yes. Yes. And so that's where the stigma came from. You're either a white woman 
or certified crazy if you got therapy. And so starting from a place of understanding that access limit point, which was literally Mm -hmm. not that long ago. Right. So understanding that, you know, within my lifetime, Mm -hmm. this existed. Mm -hmm. And when we go to the Black community and then you know, I would naively be like, well, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want the therapy? You know what I mean? Like, it's available yeah. under your health insurance. I don't understand. Yeah. Not understanding the historic boundaries. And yeah. there's so many systems of system. There's so many examples of systematic racism within our policies and in our, our country's history. But with that being one of them, specific to mental health, mm-hmm. like, if you don't understand the systemic racism that was put in policies literally since we've been alive yes it's really hard for you to get to the root of the issue Mm -hmm. without understanding where it came from so those those stigmas were validated at one point absolutely and that's why i think as a as represent representatives of the field we have to acknowledge that history like we can't walk into a room and i hold myself to the standard too and just expect folks to trust us you know, we got we to gotta do the work. If, if we did if we did the hurt, we got to put in the work to do the healing. And so I think, you know, it comes to validating where people are and their ability to and their willingness to move into this space and then trying our best to make sure that when they do come into this space, we have the skills, we are working to be aware of our own biases because we all have them. And mm-hmm. we're working to, you know what I mean, and to, to kind of, um, acknowledge that and validate that because th- that's where healing comes in. We can't just act like these things didn't happen and aren't still happening today. So, For sure, for sure. So what tools can we use to find balance in our day-to-day? Ooh, um, I think for me, two, two tools that come to mind are self-awareness and self-compassion. Like mm-hmm. I think... And also, I think it's important to really define what we mean by balance and finding balance, because often when I hear people talking about it, it's as if, like, it's this thing you obtain and now you got it. You know what I mean? Like, you plan, I see what balance and balance is like, ah, you caught me, I'm here. Like, it's not like that. Like, (laughs) it's an ongoing process. Every day. Yes. And and I think we can sometimes send the message that you're failing or you're not doing it right if you're if you're in the process of juggling that. So I think first and foremost, we have to just give ourselves permission to be constantly, you know, finding balance. Um, I think for me, the, the self-awareness piece comes to, you know, what can I handle? What can I tolerate? Again, black women, super women. We're beautiful. We're resilient. We we're all the things. We're the trendsetters. However, sometimes we tired. Sometimes we need a break. Sometimes we tired. We tired. <laughs> and that's okay. Like I have to I have to challenge myself on a regular basis. Like, is this a is this a is this a seventy five percent day? Is this a hundred percent day? Is this a baseline day where I just I'm showing and understanding up? that seventy five percent for a black woman is still probably outperforming the rest of the world. But I don't, I don't even I don't have, have my tea. I don't have my tea. That's <laughs> it. I'm gonna just <laughs> Wait, I didn't mean to, you know, interrupt you with facts or whatever, but <laughs> Yes with facts. <laughs> But yes, like being aware, being aware of what you can provide, what space you can hold and what space you can't, and then having compassion for yourself around that, you know, like giving, you're human. We are human, even though historically and currently they try to snatch our humanity away from us, giving yourself some love and some self-soothing and compassion around what you can and cannot do. Because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. We get a lot of pressure but we also put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be everything for everybody. No. And that's the thing, um, especially when you said like the self-compassion, I feel like we're forgiving of everyone. We're compassionate with everyone. We're loving with everyone. Um, but we feel guilty for doing that in return to ourselves. Yes. Yes. That is so true. And true. that's the one thing I would love every black woman who's listening to this to really just evaluate like when's the last time you did something for you Mm -hmm. and I heard a quote and they were like 
if you can't say no to to someone, at least say yes to yourself. Period. Like, at least say yes to you. Yes. Um, if you struggle saying no, and understand, first of all, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> like, I mean, I could put pleasantries on that, but like, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I don't have to um, explain every no. It's just a no. Giving yourself permission to yeah. set boundaries, you know, like and, and flexibility around all of that. Because I think you're right. Like sometimes no is no, and that's and that's it. Um, and then sometimes yeah, like no, but I'm willing to do this or no. Um, not right now. And you know, being honest with that. Yes, yes. Because I feel like sometimes it's either we, a lot of times in, in our society, it's like either or, black or white. It's like either yes all the way or no completely. And mm-hmm. it's like, w- there's room for nuance. There's room for flexibility. Exactly. Yeah. And like um, an example just came to my mind. Um, I have, she's like an unofficial mentee in my sorority. And um she called me and said um, that she was out of town. Her mom was in a hospital. Um, and this was probably like on a Wednesday or something like that. And on Friday was wear red day for our sorority. Like we were wearing red for child. I can't even remember why, but I don't own red. So like, I kind of just like threw it out my mind. Cause I was like, mm-hmm. I don't even own red, whatever. Um, <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, but we were having the conversation on Wednesday and she literally was like, do I need to go to the store to buy red? I'm like, girl, it's a social media campaign. Like you're feeling so much pressure because you forgot to pack a red shirt to participate in a social media campaign and your mama in the hospital. Yes. It's not that deep. Yes. We gotta, you gotta one, evaluate what's important. Like, if you can participate, like, that's the thing. It was never a mandated conversation. Right. But she took on that weight and that responsibility to participate when it was like, if you have read, wear it on Friday. You yeah. know what I mean? It wasn't a, like, we need everyone in red because, of, like, it wasn't that at all. And I'm like, yeah. you know, that's just one example of how we put so much pressure on ourselves for the littlest of things. Yes. Like, sorority ain't gonna even notice that you didn't participate. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. not a community service effort. It's an awareness conversation. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm sure it was, like, community service related. I, right. I wish I knew. But, um, but it's one of those things where it's like, yes. You, like, it'd be great. But, like, the world will continue. Yes. Like, yeah. it. The show will go on if you don't pick up every ball. Like, you can drop a few. It's okay. That's okay. And it's okay. And it's okay. okay. Yes. Because what, what it, it comes down to sometimes, I'm not, you know, I don't want to generalize too much, but what, what are we using to measure our worth? Mm. We are. Mm. The society tells us productivity looks a certain type of way or success looks a certain type of way. And I do think like it is important to be thoughtful about that, right? How do you want to be successful? How do you want to be productive? But productive is also, you know, me sitting down and journaling and working through my experiences. Productive mm-hmm. is also me taking time for self-care, me taking time to pour into my family, my mother who, you know, for in that example, my mother's in the hospital. That's productive for me as well. And so I think we, we put so much pressure in it and we don't realize how much that builds up over time. Yeah. And we carry it all. Like, it's not like we set it down at the end of the day and be like, whew, that was a long day. No, that it begins to compound. Yeah. And then eventually we just break. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I remember hearing um, T.D. Jakes, one day they asked him, like, how do you do all that you do? You know, you preach and you do movies and you do CDs and books and, you yeah. know, conferences and all of these things. Like, how do you do it all on top of, you know, having a wife and kids? Right. And his response, and now grandchildren, um, but his response was, every day I'm going to disappoint somebody. Every day I'm going to drop the ball on something. 
it's my job to just make sure that it doesn't become a habit with the same person and that I don't drop the same ball every day. And I think when I heard that, I was like, oh, like it was so freeing because it really released you of that pressure of being perfect. I don't have to be perfect. I just have to make sure I don't create a habit of disappointing one individual person. Yes. Today ain't your day to be disappointed. It might you know, tomorrow might be be your day. But today I got you. Today we good. Got you. We good. (laughs) Today is your day. But you know, tomorrow looking a little fuzzy. I might be tired, you know, um, but and it's, and even within that freedom, like I'm still not, you know, looking for people to disappoint every day, but giving myself permission to say, like, I don't have to do everything perfect every single day. Yes. I just have to make sure that I don't miss two of your calls in a row. Mm-hmm. I don't miss two of our meetings in a row. Yeah. I don't ignore two of your emails back to back. You know what I mean? Like it's it's really just about evaluating the the habits. So if we yes. have if we have if you and I have a relationship and nine times out of ten I show up for you. Yes. Um, that ten time ain't gonna really be as bad. Right. Because I've 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 communicated and demonstrated with my actions that I value you. Yeah. And that you are important to me. Yep. Yeah. And I actually had this conversation with my little sister um, a few years ago. And I remember telling her, I was like, when I became old enough to kind of like make plans with my sister, I guess probably around the time when I started driving, mm-hmm. um, or even beyond that, actually, when like just plans to like watch a movie or, you know, whatever. If I make plans with my sister, I make a conscious effort to never flake on my sister. Mm-hmm. I will not flake. I will not cancel. I will go into debt, I will, you know, if we go into the movies, we go into the movies. I don't yeah. care how we get there, but we go into the goddamn movies, okay? Yes, yeah, we get um, it done. And I've had that habit for as far back as I can remember. Yeah. But, and and it also, side note, that challenges me to be intentional about what I agree to with her. Yes. yes. Um, but, and I and I told her, I was like, you know, with her with her father at that given point in her life, I was like, you know, if he were to cancel on you, you would you would be disappointed, but if I canceled, you'd be a little bit more understanding. And she was like, "Yeah, um, you know." She agreed, and I said, "The reason being is not that canceling was di- was weighted one- more in one case or the other because mm-hmm. you know she values both relationships." I said, "It's the history." Yes, because I have a habit of showing up. Yeah, if I have to cancel that one time. You're a little bit more understanding. Mm-hmm. But if I'm constantly fl- canceling, if I'm constantly flaking, if I'm constantly not showing up for you, it's a lot more disappointing because it's a habit. Yes. Patterns. It's more intentional about the patterns yes. um, of, you know, showing up and doing the things that you're saying you're going to do rather than, um, and even though he's gotten a lot better in her life now, it's like she's 18 now. Right. You have 18 years of habits to, re- to recover from. Absolutely. Right. You got to heal. You got to put in the work to heal this relationship. You have to put in the work to heal the relationship that you were inconsistent with. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so that was a tangent. But that'd be well, okay. I liked it. I liked it. It was good. <laughs> Gems in there or whatever. Um, so how can we better support the mental health of Black women in America? Um, support Black women in America? <laughs> no, but specifically, specifically, <laughs> like um, I think um, I think we have to we have to listen to Black women when they say when they tell us when we tell what we need when we express what we need and also and also consider again I'm uh, always taking a historical perspective consider the history and the things that black women have been through and are currently struggling with. Because I think when we come from a place of compassion and I challenge myself to do this, um, we can take empathy and understand where some of the reactions are coming from. So black women carry a lot 
and we are magic we are beautiful we are all these things but we're also human and sometimes that means that we're still trying to figure out our language and our comfort with expressing the hurts and the triumphs and so i think we really just need to listen to black women support them when they say that they need us um and and just show up i mean i think i think the the recent um experience of Gabrielle Union is a really good example of, you know, an opportunity that a Black man had to support a Black woman. And um, unfortunately, if, I feel like he didn't take that chance. He didn't take that opportunity. And I think that what was most disappointing about that moment for most of the Black community is that who it was, right? Prior to that experience, Gabrielle Union showed up for him specifically and very loudly fought him. Yes. And when he had the opportunity to reciprocate, he was like, that ain't my problem. Right. And so I want to be I want to be thoughtful about this because I do recognize um, within the black community, we, we do have our own unique relationship to the black man. And there's history there and there's nuance there. And so I don't, I don't want to communicate any, I'm, I'm coming with love, you know, at the same time, like, I think it's particularly, particularly difficult for me. I'll speak for myself as a black woman when I'm getting it from outside. And then when I come inside and I'm getting it as well, yeah. you know what I mean? Especially for the way that I feel like black women have historically shown up for black men. Um, and I think that's the thing. It's like, so I'm coming from a loving place as well, but for me, it's like loving accountability. Yes. <laughs> um, I, and I, I do love black men. I will ride for black men. Um, I want my husband to be a black man, you know, like that, that's just, you know, I also recognize that, um, I think that was just one of the first times, like, we talk about it as a concept that mm-hmm. black women defend black men and you know we show up for you guys and then you guys don't show up for us but i think it was like damn like that's the exact black man she showed up that that literally. exact black woman showed up for literally the receipts literally. are there literally the exact yeah. black man that that exact black woman stood up for and then when that exact human had the opportunity to reciprocate or at least just say nothing. Right. Right. You could have said nothing. You could have sat nothing. there and ate your food. No comment. Boop. And the world would have never known. But you decided to just say, meh. Yeah. The only black woman I care about is my wife. Okay, but what about your kids? You don't care about your daughters? Oh, why? Right. You don't care about your mama? Um, your auntie don't love you? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes. You know, and I think so I think that was part of the outrage was like it was more than just like a concept. It was more than an ideal. It was exact for that scenario. It was like, damn. You know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, That situation was pretty bad. But I I cannot say that without saying that there are Black women, Black men who um, respect Black women. There are Black men who show up for us. There are Black who are protective without any kind of hope for gain or, you know, anything like that. Um, So I'm not saying any of that to Black, to bash a Black man, because just like we take it in the world, they take it too. Absolutely. And I think that to that point, like I, I recently went to um, a conference for, for higher ed. And when I tell you, I, I sat through some presentations of some phenomenal black men who were thoughtful about intersectionality, thoughtful about like taking the historical lens, protecting black women, but also healing within our community. Like, I don't want to paint the, the, the false narrative that they aren't out right. here for us as well. For sure. Um, and I think it, it, I almost in those sessions almost was like Terry seeing that in full display, you know, because it's like such a beautiful thing when you see a person who looks like you and, uh, and you know, particularly a black man up there in a presentation setting, defending the honor of black women, you know, and, and taking that perspective. 
So I think, yeah, everything was nuanced, everything was um, with the understanding of that, that nuance, but also accountability. So we're holding both. Yeah, for sure. So what is your personal mental health routine? Ooh, personal mental health routine. Um, I have a few go-tos. I think for me, the gym is necessary. Can we, we talk okay. about this? <laughs> So, you know, I, you yes. know, I hate working out, but it is now at the point, like, I can't even sleep at night if I didn't go to the gym. And I'm like, this is irritating. I yes. don't, yes. I don't like feeling like I need to work out. Yes. This is yes. irritating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's stuff for, I mean, to each their own, everyone who's listening, like find your own thing. But I think the gym for me, it does a couple of things like there. First off, obviously, like there's the um, there's the aesthetic piece, right? Like, oh girl, you cut up, you looking yes. good. Yes, I see. Summer bodies are made in the winter. Come on, all <laughs> that, right? So then, of course, that's a piece of it. I, I want to acknowledge that. But then there's like the, uh, I don't know, like the release that happens and the the connection to your body. Like, yeah. ooh, look what you can do. Like, look at look at the progress. Yeah. Look at you know what I mean? So there's that. And um, therapy. To go further than, like, you thought you could. Yes. Yes. And in a very tangible way, right? right. Like, oh, I, 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 added, I added five pounds. Like, I couldn't do this, you know, a month ago. Yeah. So, so like, yesterday, I ran, a, I ran a 5K without stopping, and I was like, okay. Girl. Yeah. Yes. When I say I was dripping in sweat, but it felt good to accomplish it, especially knowing that like that I had done Monday through Friday five days. So to get through five, you know, five in one week, and for the fifth one to be, um, and I actually built up over the week. So like I did one minute without stopping, then I did a minute and a half or a mile and a half without stopping, then two miles without stopping, then two and a half, and then to hit three point one. Um, without stopping, I was like, yo. You lit. Good. You lit. You <laughs> lit out here. <laughs> yes. yes. That accomplishment factor, for sure. Yes. So, yes. working out. Yes, working out. Um, I'm, I'm in therapy, so very, therapy is a big part of that for me, too. Just having a place to work through and process my feelings, my emotion, my reactions. Um, humor. I to pause and say... Yes. You just heard a therapist say she has a therapist. So I don't want to hear nothing about I don't need a therapist. Yeah. I think therapists need them the most, if I could just say that. And honestly, I feel that way about being like a business coach. If you're a business coach, you don't have a business coach, you should be concerned. You should be concerned. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. Because we need it. We need it the most, right? Yeah. It's that release, it's that outlet, but it's also that accountability too. Yes. For, so we got working out, therapy. Yes, humor, humor, and that comes in all different forms. When I tell you I laugh and I laugh hard and I laugh good, like whether that be with my people, whether that be like intentionally seeking like, you know, media or whatever it is that makes me laugh, like that has to be there because that's just, I don't know, it's just a natural, it's a natural after the medicine of the soul yes yes so that it, has to be yeah. there I, I like that too so you know I'm a clown so I'm always mm-hmm. cracking it. Mm-hmm. I need help in the work don't even want to <laughs> um, <laughs> but no like I constantly look for opportunities to laugh and I'm like if I laugh that's the goal if other people happen to laugh like you're welcome right but I'm one of the same me <laughs> okay I'm gonna laugh I'm gonna laugh man <laughs> And if you laugh, so great. Like, yes. I'm so glad you laughed. <laughs> but also, yes. I needed to laugh. That that was the purpose here. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. yes, even on those days where like I'm ha- I'm in a bad mood, I'm you know feeling really down. Like I have intentionally put on like a funny movie or. Yes watching stand-up or, yeah. you know, whatever, um, to kind of just get me out of that energy. And sometimes mm-hmm. you just need to, like, laugh it out. You do. And the movie go off and you like, all right, I, I can feel, do I feel better. Yeah. Same thing with music. 
Music yeah. is like, yeah. oh girl, playlist. I got a playlist for feeling empowered. I got a playlist yeah. for in my feelings. I got a playlist yeah. for when I'm feeling like I need to get booked. Like I got, I got a work playlist. You okay, have that. and then I got the gospel one too. Balance. You gotta have that balance. Balance. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. I got the love playlist. I got the you know playlist. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah like i I, and i agree with you with music as well like music definitely has the ability to like shift the energy yes absolutely yes so that i think that's yeah that's it okay so what would you say is your number one secret to success Ooh, i was thinking about this because you know I'm like, what is the number? It, honestly, I have to acknowledge, of course, like my my relationship with God, my faith. For sure. For I'm sure. still like navigating that relationship, learning what I want to take from this, you know, this relationship, and and just exploring and involving in that. Um, but honestly, like I feel like I gotta acknowledge my people. Like that for me is the is the secret, the key that I I have people around me, and I feel like I. I I'm so fortunate and blessed because I keep people around me that are just thoughtful, reflective, diverse, beautiful energies, souls. And they hold me accountable. They support me. They um, look out for me, like all of these things. So I feel like as I reflect on like moments of hardship or moments of triumph, like it's the common denominator has been having people around me who are, you know, wanting to see me win and pulling for that. So I think that's the secret for me. That that's the secret. Okay. So what final thoughts do you have for the audience? Final thoughts. Um, I think I just want to encourage people to check in with yourself. Is it serving you? Mm. Yes. No, maybe that can be. And not it is are they <laughs> that human that, also that can be a relationship that can be your way of thinking that can be your current circumstances like is it ask yourself that awareness is it serving you and then the next step to that I would say is like based on whatever answer you come up with what do you have to do to put yourself in a position to make the changes that are needed because mm-hmm. we can have insight about a thing but not be ready to make change and take action. Exactly. And both are important. So is it serving you? Yes, no, maybe. And then what do you do with that? How do you get yourself in a position where you're able to make the moves that are necessary? Awesome. Awesome. So where can people find you? Email me. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I'm still figuring out my social media presence. I want to navigate that. Wait, Um, you um, we about to talk about that as soon yes. as it stop recording. Um, okay. we're gonna have a strategy session. Okay. But anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you feel comfortable, would you share your email address with the people? So just in case they have any um mental health questions or concerns or um need suggestions. Absolutely. Um you can email me at Amani A M A N I J O H at Buffalo dot E D U. Um, and that is an email that I check regularly, typically Monday through Friday, boundaries. Hello, boundaries. Boundaries. Um, but yes, you can reach out to me there. I can send resources if you need, if you have questions, I'm able to, you know, fill those. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Not only for, um, being my first best friend, (laughs) um, and, but also being my adult friend too. Um, and being a part of my support system and just showing up for me as many times as you have, um, including being a part of this podcast, um, even though, you know, I love you and you're a great friend in my life. Um, I also feel like you have such a um, perspective yeah. to share. And I, I hope someone got something good from today's conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, like, before we end, I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that you you created this platform and you are out here killing it. OK, like you are out here thriving. You are pursuing your, your business entrepreneurship. You are just just creating spaces. And I think I, I can't come on here and not acknowledge that. 
Oh. So, shout out I, to you. I appreciate it. I, listen, I really feel like I'm just out here doing the Lord's work, okay? Oh, okay. Um, and, and I say it jokingly. Like, it sounds like a joke, but I'm really being serious. Like, um, I've come to the result that, like, my life is not for my benefit. Yeah. And that's okay. I was, like, and every time I feel like... Um, and, you know, you and I have had those conversations mm-hmm. with feeling like no one really checks on me. No one's there for me. Like, you know, people ask how you're doing, but I do, are they really asking? You know, and those kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, and every time I get into that feeling, God always reminds me, like, I put you on this earth to serve. And that's just what it is. Um, and so taking that as a badge of honor. So I appreciate your acknowledgement, um, but yeah. I genuinely feel like, I am doing the Lord's work and what helps me keep going is making sure that I'm caring for myself first. Yes, it's needed. It's necessary. For sure. I can pour all day long as long as my cup is full. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So thanks, Mommy. Of course, of course.